As you undoubtedly realize, stress patterns are highly individual. Uh, they arise from patterns within our own thoughts and emotions, and if these patterns become habitual, they can become so pressureful that we have little, if any, ability to resist them. Stress for one person is not necessarily stress for another, nor do large problems always bring with them the greater stress. We know that the physical system of man is so constituted that under legitimate stress he receives strong and sudden endocrine strength by secretions in the body which are intended uh, to press energy into areas when these areas are suddenly called upon. Nature tries to help us to keep a reasonable degree of optimism, but nature cannot provide adequately for excessive habit patterns. If the mind and emotions exhaust the natural defense media, ultimately the person no longer receives this support and finds it easier and easier to fall into negative moods. Probably subconsciously, we are more aware of values than we are consciously. Therefore, nature does not support with special energy, negative neurotic situations. Nature is telling us that it will not justify or contribute to false emotional or mental stress. It will help us when the emergency is real, but it will not support the nagger or the chronic worrier or the perpetual fault finder. Thus the person again has a certain censorship arising from natural function itself. And if we are consistent with nature and natural law, we will have a measure of security when real need arises. We cannot be rewarded, however, for just making mistakes. One of the basic principles behind nearly all stress situations is the retention factor. Retention is largely the inability of the person to let go. Most problems can be helped by a release process. This is particularly true on the level of memory. If we are willing to let go of negative thoughts, if we simply fail to sustain them by direct conscious effort, they will have a tendency to weaken. We know, for example, in hypnotic regression work, that the individual's memory or awareness of significant episodes or retained episodes will be greater than his retention of areas where little or nothing seemed important to him. Thus the depth of the groove that is cut in memory by a circumstance largely depends upon how we have accepted that circumstance and the degree of importance that we have bestowed upon it. Thus we have a conscious problem continuously of trying to determine what is important. And to be important, a memory must be basically good. Negative thoughts and emotions cannot be regarded as truly important. They become so if we think about them enough, worry about them, and pity ourselves, or use them as methods of evading personal responsibility. We can make negative records deep and lasting, but to do this we must give them a great deal of emotion and thought. 
If we simply refuse to vitalize these situations, they have a tendency to fade out and also to leave less scar tissue in our psychological nature. Consciously, therefore, we begin the process of determining the nature of things to be remembered or forgotten. We can remember by forcing a situation, a person wishing to remember the name of someone, can do a great deal to ensure that this name is not forgotten. One of the common practices, for example, is to repeat the name a number of times. By this process, it becomes more deeply fixed in the memory. We also can make association relationships, which uh, constitutes the principal secret of the so-called better memory systems. For these systems, we take a new name or a new personality and adjust it in some way to previously known or remembered names or personalities. Thus, we gain the assistance of an association, a recollection that causes us to remember one and become mindful of the other. Thus, we know that memory can be deepened by a definite determination to remember that particular subject. We also know, as Rene Descartes, the great French philosopher, pointed out, that once a memory has been established, it becomes stronger in our subconscious than in our conscious uh, recollection. Consequently, when we are trying to think of someone's name, whose name we should remember. Consciously, we sometimes become confused. The harder we try to think, the more elusive that name becomes. And if we struggle with it hard enough and long enough, we never will remember it. On the other hand, under such conditions, if we will simply relax the mind totally, we will suddenly find that this name will appear within our memory. And uh, it seems that the uh, continuance of the surface stress has a tendency to deny the recollection that we most desire. These principles can be used in psychological conditioning today. And we fully recognize that much information and many thoughts that we have stored away perhaps only under the immediate surface of our minds, can be quickly brought into focus by means of receptivity of attitude. Relaxation will bring these facts back to our conscious awareness. This is probably one of the reasons why most persons do not like to relax or are afraid to. The moment we seize the surface conflict of thinking, we have available to us this subsurface area of memories, remembrances, and associations. For most persons, these are not fortunate. They are not happy. And left to our own mental and emotional devices, we see or believe that it is more important to remain in a stimulated state in order to blot out that which comes to mind when we are not consciously controlling mental process. The answer, obviously, is that this load that we are carrying below the surface is therefore constantly present and insinuates itself not only into our uh, relaxation, but to a measure into our active mental procedure. Once we have taken an attitude or decided something or become convinced of something, this attitude or conviction will certainly be present as an equation in every thought that we have. Certainly every thought which has any bearing upon a related subject. We may not always be consciously aware that we are thinking from personal prejudice, but if there is a prejudice, it will influence us. If there is a blind spot in our own thinking, 
this blind spot will mutilate practically any thought that we have. So we are not only in danger of this flood coming in upon us when we relax, it is also present in our conscious processes and will affect us whenever we permit ourselves a reflective or introspective mood. When we try to think things through, we will think them through according to the thoughts that we have available. And if these thoughts are not essentially good, our conclusions will not be essentially good. Though it is not possible for the average person to live a life of activity without a certain number of unfortunate episodes occurring, the person is bound to be under some kind of stress sometime. Very often these stress patterns are rather frequent. Then perhaps there will be an interlude in which they will be less frequent. But certainly we cannot go through life without episodes occurring which are unpleasant or dangerous or disappointing or frustrating to us in one way or another. Our first problem is our attitude toward these as they occur. Very often we can rationalize a situation even while we are instinctively passing through unpleasantness. Perhaps we can suddenly, dominantly realize that the situation is of our own making, that somewhere in the pattern we have set the stage for this. Therefore, that we have no right uh, to regard the incident as unreasonable or unfair. If we can take the unfairness out of a retention situation, we weaken its ability to hurt us later. If we can take the injustice out, if we can take the personal jealousies out, the self-pity out, even while we are recording the incident, what is left is essentially factual. And if we can supply this subconsciousness only with fact, we are usually in a safer situation. Facts are not dramatic. Very few people ever get worked up over a fact. Even if it's an unpleasant fact, we say this is the way it is, and so we must accept it. Most of our serious retentions are not factual. They are highly glamorized interpretations of incidents, glamorized to serve some ulterior purpose in our own mental-emotional processes. They support something we want to believe, but not necessarily anything factual. They help us to justify ourselves in a false situation where we should not be justified. But it is so pleasant to justify ourselves, even at the expense of facts and very often at the expense of the rights of other people. So in the beginning, uh, we can censor that which we retain. If we look back upon something that happened 10 or 15 years ago, and we can honestly and sincerely say to ourselves, this was a landmark of my own stupidity. Seldom did I do anything worse than the way I handled that situation. This type of situation, this type of reaction, is not inclined to or likely to create a psychosis. If, however, we have carefully worked this situation over with our imagination and our various personalized uh, emotions and thoughts, so that we look back and we say, never have I suffered so without just cause as on that occasion. This attitude will give us that nice, warm, rosy glow that is associated with certain processes of disintegration. This type of thinking will ensure us that gradually our attitude toward the whole world, toward the universe, toward God and nature will be less honorable. And from this situation, 
we also have a wonderful springboard in which we can develop further self-pity. Because perhaps out of this very stupid thing that we did, a number of unpleasant circumstances arose. If we justify the original action, which should not have been justified, then we certainly are in a condition to suffer acutely from all the succeeding consequences. These consequences then become merely further punishment. We are not at fault in anything. And as soon as we reach that degree of mental astigmatism in which we are no longer at fault, a condition in which most other people are bad or wrong, but we are strangely and mystically right in everything. When we get to that position, we are heading into a very dangerous mental habit, one that will ultimately cause us misery, will lose us our friends, perhaps destroy our business and break up our home. After these consequences of set in, then we are ready for more self-pity, because we started with the wrong basic premise, and everything else uh, became uh, further justification for the fact that the world was against us. It is very important then, and this is one of the contributions that philosophy can make, to the life of man, that when every situation that is obscure or mysterious and apparently hurtful arises in our affairs, that we should sit down and think it through, then and there. Because if we can think it through the first day, it will do us very little damage, providing we come up with some kind of an honorable or honest conclusion. Perhaps the second or third day, will still be good time in which to work the problem out. But if we wait for six months or a year or look back ten years later, the damage is done. We have already twisted and distorted our thinking so long that it is probably impossible for us to arrive at any honest or honorable conclusion. If we believe in philosophy, particularly the great classical systems of the East and West, we must face the situation that philosophy teaches us that we live in an honest world, that the things that happen to us are the results of what we are, and that the so-called injuries that come to us from others depend upon ourselves for the degree of injury which they can cause. It is very unpleasant, perhaps, when someone else insults us. But this is not important. It is what we do about it that immediately sets up patterns. It is very important, therefore, how we react to the action of another person. Sometimes we can also be devastating as far as the other person is concerned. Someone will turn to us and say, well, you are the largest fool in 16 states. He's expecting a nice, happy fight and has perhaps a desire to do all that he can to humiliate us or antagonize us. But if we turn to him and say with a real meaningful smile, I know it, now what do we do? He is entirely disarmed. There's not much left for him to do. And anyone who doesn't know that he's a, probably one of the largest fools in any 16 states, uh, probably has overestimated himself to begin with. We are all foolish. Let us begin by realizing this. And if someone tells us, he's really doing us a favor. Now, we don't necessarily agree with him in all details. Perhaps we may think at the moment that he is much more wrong than we are. If we have any feelings about the matter, we certainly have a right uh, to state our position. If he doesn't like that, he's in the same class that we are in. We didn't like what he said. That makes two people just alike. If, however, we have reason to believe he may be correct, then there is no use being proud. 
He has probably done us more good by pointing out our weakness than he could by agreeing with us in our mistake. The least we can say about his remark is that it's stimulating. And from that point on, we can investigate it. If he's right, we can tell him so sometime. If we do not think he is right, we can disprove him by our own conduct. Uh, Thus, we do not need to begin the process of building up a bitter antagonism over something of this nature. We do not need to begin to assume that this other person is an adversary who must be discomforted at all cost. And there is no reason why we should sit down and remember this episode for the rest of our days and list it among the precious beads on that little rosary of our discontent that we say several times a day. There is no need for this type of thinking. Also, there are episodes that arise in which perhaps the factors are more real or vital. One of our problems may be in life that we are naturally rather good-natured people. We like to try to help when we can. Very often our help is exploited. Very often when we are kind-hearted, we are simply uh, interpreted as being weak. And when we try to be kind to people, they think we're afraid of them. Well, what they think isn't really very important. The question is, what were our motives? Were our own motives right? If our motives were right, the problem of the misinterpretation rests with the person who misinterprets, not with us. There is no reason why we can't like people for what they are, even while we have reservations about what they do. There is a great deal of difference in these points. Perhaps we would realize that if we were in their place, with the experiences that they have had, they might, we might well then be as suspicious as they are. These values perhaps may seem to be evasional, but the truth of the situation is usually our charity is more honorable than our criticism. It is so very easy to condemn others. It is so very easy to read the worst into a situation. Yet in so doing, we are not fair and not reasonable. More important, we are doing ourselves an injustice. We are preparing the way to be less likable, less happy, less healthy individuals. These are processes we cannot afford. It may be that we would gain certain satisfaction from retaining a bitter memory of someone through the years. We think that they deserve it. But can we afford it? at any time or in any way. If this bitter memory adds up 30 or 40 years later to several thousand dollars worth of doctor's bills and situations in which we have lost the right to do many things that we would have enjoyed and might have been beneficial to us because we have allowed this acidity to eat away our inner resources, can we afford this? Is there really any satisfaction? When we hold a negative attitude against another person, we are probably doing that person no harm at all. They do not know or they do not care. They likewise feel that they are right. But we are doing ourselves a serious injury. We are preparing the way for loss of personal efficiency. And it is not these other situations that are revenging themselves on us. We are taking this attitude and destroying ourselves, committing a kind of psychological suicide by nursing grievances. We can't afford to do it. Perhaps in the last century when uh, we paid the physician with ham hocks, it was possible to do these things. But at the present prices, it is not. It might have been all right when we could buy the bottle of patent medicine that contained enough alcohol to soothe our nerves to uh, hold these grudges and buy the 50-cent remedy. But today you're liable to pay $20 a hundred for these gentle little pills that have a tendency to temporarily get your mind off of your own bad thinking. Why pay this money for it? What satisfaction can we possibly have 
from a negative attitude that can begin to equal the injury and the negation which it sets up in our own natures. So every once in a while, if we're not enjoying a fair degree of harmony and optimism, it may be well to enter into our own subconscious and do a little house cleaning. Try to get rid of these attitudes. Realize that the junk in the attic is no longer valuable to us. That there is no amount of nostalgia about our own miseries that can possibly compensate for the harm that it is doing us now. An episode that occurred 20 years ago is dead. The old philosophers had much to say about the past. The past is actually something that no longer exists. The person himself, the very rememberer, no longer exists, as he did at the time of the incident which he is trying to recollect. His own past is dead. The world of situations through which he passed ceased to be alive the moment time moved on. And as Plato pointed out, too many of us, too many of the living, are still ruled by the dead. And there is nothing more dead than our yesterdays. The only thing about the past that is valuable is the experience which it gives us, by means of which we can face the present with a better hope. Any experience out of the past that helps us to live better today is the harvest of the past. Any experience out of the past that overshadows us with negation and will not permit us to live better today, and in such a thing as this, is a kind of ghost coming to us from the haunted house of our own minds and rattling its chains to interfere with our living mentation and emotional progress. So let us work some way, as much as we can, on this problem of retention. Let us try not to have the past uh, build in so firmly. There's one other phase of this I'd like to mention in passing because I think uh, too many people overlook it. Going down through the years out of this experience procedure that we have passed through, it is amazing how few interesting experiences come to the mind of a neurotic. He can look back over 50 years of life and find almost nothing that really intrigues his mind constructively. You try to work with him on problems of this nature. What were his interests in those days? What was he doing? What were the constructive adventures? Uh, what was the creativity that he was expressing? How was he building himself a richer internal life. For the most part, you will find it was a vast, ignored area. You go back in the life of this person, if it's a man, and you say, well, I had my business. I worked hard. I went to the office every day. I came home at night tired, read the paper, went to bed. Well, with a pattern like that to work from, it's quite obvious that the only incidents that would stand out probably, are tragedies. There were no constructive, compensating activities. Oh, perhaps once in a while, went out and played a poor game of golf and swore his way around the golf course. Perhaps he went out occasionally with some minor social activity, belonged to a lodge or joined some fraternity. But for the most part, his life was a mental, emotional blank as far as worthwhile things are concerned. May have had a few hobbies. Perhaps he had none. Perhaps as he approaches retirement, he can look back and see that there's nothing to look forward to. The only thing he can have any satisfaction out of at all is that he's probably going to get the government to pay him back some money in the form of a pension. This is a sort of revenge against the high cost of living. But there is so little for this person to dig out of his own subconscious that means anything. 
And where there is no good harvest present, where the garden has never been planted, where the gardener has never taken care of it, it's not surprising that it's full of weeds. They're about the only thing that can be guaranteed to grow under all conditions. Now the same is true of the woman passing through these situations. Her usual defense for the whole problem is family. She's given her life, her thought, her activity to her home. She has built her children and later perhaps her grandchildren so completely into her consciousness that what happens to them is all that remains that is of any vital interest to herself or to anyone else as far as she is concerned. Her big emotional moments are when the grandchild gets the measles or perhaps the terrible time when her only son married the wrong girl. These are the only big memories that she has. She has failed utterly to build her own life. If she goes back, therefore, she cannot remember interesting, creative things. Unless we do things that are interesting, we will not have interesting memories. And if our memories are not interesting, they're not worth living with. Yet there are times in the life of everyone when they have to live with them to some degree. It is an amazing situation that a nation, a race, as well endowed as we are with capacities and abilities, living a standard of life as high as the one that we live, enjoying the privileges and opportunities that we enjoy every day, how we can pass through this process of interesting experience, completely insulated from it, gaining almost nothing, and doing very few things that provide any wealth of memory or any important uh, thinking. Most of the neurotic people are individuals who have not had any interesting mental or emotional experiences or such experiences as they did have were so intensely personal that everything was measured in terms of pleasure or pain alone and not in terms of values. If therefore we come into this problem of retention and we say to ourselves we can retain a dozen tragedies, why cannot we retain a dozen great experiences that are themselves equally valuable and important to us. I remember one lady of considerable means who liked to travel very extensively. Uh, she came back from one of her usual trips. She spent a great deal of money in travel, spent most of her time traveling. It was largely an escape from this same poverty of internal. But one day she mentioned to me that she had just been over in Holland and she went into considerable discussion of the beauties of Holland. So I asked her what she had seen over there that particularly impressed her. And she said the tulips were lovely. So a little later I said, well, what else did you see in Holland? She said, more tulips. Nothing could get beyond this point. She had been there, she had spent months there, she had seen nothing but some lovely tulips. Well, that's better than nothing, let's face it. But at the same time, it certainly isn't a maximum return for probably a $10,000 investment. Something more could have been done. The result was that the next year she had to go back again for the tulips. There was nothing else to do. This type of situation does not uh, carry with it uh, the rewards that are natural to interesting experiences. When this woman sat down and became quiet and had to live with her own recollections, she could probably remember many things that hurt her, troubled her, worried her, that had been unfortunate or unhappy experiences in her life. But when the time came to compensate for this, 
with the wonderful things that had happened, the interesting and tremendous things she had learned. She was exhausted entirely by a memory of tulips. There was nothing to balance the importance of the negative factors. She had been immune to the positive side. And this is a mistake that a great many persons make. No amount of opportunity or privilege, no amount of wealth or uh, activity can compensate for negative attitudes unless we use these positive situations to create something to be remembered. Something that makes life a tremendously vital experience. If these memories are lacking, it's too bad. The next thing to do, however, is to create some. And wherever we are, we must begin to build values that become subconscious strength, subconscious source of inspiration, so that when we relax, something nice comes to our memory, instead of the good things being very rare and the unfortunate things all too numerous. Of course, there is the classic story about the fact that we take good things for granted and do not remember them, whereas we take things that are not good as exceptions, and thereby we do remember them, so that the unfortunate always digs a deeper rut than the fortunate. I do not think this is basically true. My suspicion is uh, that we do not at the time of the experiences, make enough of the good things. We do not give them at the moment the same attention. We are not dramatically interested. And as a result, uh, that which does not fit into the misery of the moment simply is not given its due consideration. It's simply ignored. Therefore, we can say that the retention factor means that we must live with the results of our previous focal points of attention. We must continue to survive the patterns we have established. And in this way, uh, we suffer from the things we have gone through. The point of attention is, of course, deeply involved in this, for the point of attention is very valuable to us. If we can train this to the degree that it helps us to be more vitally aware of that which is important, then we can remember perhaps a little more consistently, a little more uh, watchfully and thoughtfully the things that would be useful to us. Now where this stress pattern sets in around this point of retention, we then have many other situations which accompany it. If you have noticed that when these memories or when these policies begin to move through into consciousness, that you brace yourself. In other words, whenever we are in a situation in which uh, we are now faced with a dilemma that reminds us of the past, and nearly always our dilemmas pattern, we have a certain basic psychology of our own and our troubles always fall into little patterns. If we have trouble with one person on a certain basis, we'll probably have trouble with 20 during the course of the lifetime, and it'll be always in about the same way. And the same kind of experiences will recur. One individual says, I've always been generous and I've always been imposed upon. Well, to be imposed upon once can be anyone's fault, as the Chinese pointed out. Two times, well, still a possibility of error. Perhaps we were a little 
uh, unfortunate. But when we come to be imposed on many times, there has to be some fault in ourselves. We have to be doing something wrong. We are either completely unable to judge character, or else we perform some action as we proceed which alienates people who might otherwise have a normal gratitude. Perhaps when we give someone something, we give them ourselves with it, and the gift is just too large for them. <laughs> Perhaps we expect to be entertained for the rest of our lives. Perhaps we expect to have gratitude return to us every few minutes. We never get paid for what we have done. Perhaps we have taken the wrong person and simply spoiled them. And because our judgment was bad in the first place and our generosity was unwise in the second place, our situation is uncomfortable in the third place. <laughs> there is always a reason for things. And if we follow through, we shall observe that our own misfortunes and disappointments form patterns and that these patterns are forever reminders of something we are doing wrong. Our intentions may have been good, but an intention without judgment cannot be relied upon, and a person who wishes to do good has to learn how. And if he never takes the course, his charities and generosities are likely to backfire. So if we are not getting some reasonable result for our endeavors, it is possible that we need further instruction within the field of our own interests. All the back memories, however, lead together into a kind of perpetual subjective uproar. We are not happy. We gradually develop that martyred look we become dour and suspicious. Uh, we begin to convey to other people the tragedy of our lives. This is an excellent way to have no friends. This is an excellent way to guarantee that we will have more time in which to remember the things that would be far better for us, for us to forget. Also, we can be reasonably certain that the arteries will harden a little sooner, uh, that our areas of activity will be markedly reduced, our sensory perceptions may be adversely affected, to say nothing of the possibility of developing a variety of psychological hysterias. These things are the result of continuing along with a pattern that never was any good and will never produce any good. Out of this situation, however, the wrong retentions, the wrong interpretations, and the wrong evaluations of practically everything, we come finally to a high degree of personal tension. Tension is largely a matter of our relationship to ourselves on the inside and to all other things on the outside. We often hear, of course, of timid people or individuals not well adjusted socially, the individual who is afraid to meet people, and also perhaps in later life afraid to meet himself from the interior part of his own nature. Some people magnify the importance of other people. I know a man, for example, who is really quite a gifted speaker and uh, interpreter. He's a very interesting and clever man. With the two or three of his friends sitting around at home, he is the life and soul of the party and really has many interesting things to say. He was asked on one occasion to speak for a small club in his district. There were 11 people in the audience and the man was paralyzed. He couldn't say anything. These 11 people took the proportions of ogres. As far as he was concerned, they were sitting there ready to eat him up. 
they were just more of his own friends. He knew them all. Socially, he had met them all. In his home, they were human beings. But out there in an audience, they were mystery. They were a vast order of critics, of cynics, of individuals waiting to catch him in any mistake that he could make. The only way to avoid all mistakes was to make the supreme one do nothing. So he was completely unable to adjust to a dozen of his friends simply because he was on a platform and they were sitting in front of him and all of a sudden it was an audience. The people were all friendly and pulling for him and probably suffering more than he was. He could not handle the situation. This shows how the mind, emotions, can play tricks on us and can create in us such an ex exceeding nervousness of self-consciousness that we are almost unable to function at all. The relationship between the person, therefore, and his world, and the person and his family, and the person and his social life, has to be one of relatively easy adjustment. Without this adjustment, everything is too expensive in terms of energy. It is bad enough to fight the world as we feel we must, but it is much worse than when we have to fight ourselves too. And to be forced to continually lock in conflict with our own interior institution is just a tragedy, and one that is totally and entirely unnecessary. Many uh, research projects have been carried on to try to explain the individual who is unable to adjust to those around him, who is unable to be easy in normal and ordinary situations. And several different solutions have been advanced. Perhaps one or two can be mentioned, but they do not exhaust the situation. One is that this kind of person is really an extremely proud individual. He is afraid that what he does will not be done perfectly. He is a perfectionist. He feels what, uh, like this man perhaps subconsciously felt when he couldn't speak to his friends, that unless he can give the greatest and best talk he, anyone has ever heard, he just can't say anything. He's got to excel. Now in this world, this desire to do a job well is perfectly commendable. But this peculiar unwillingness uh, to open oneself to even a reasonable criticism shows a kind of pride, a perfectionism, a strange kind of complex which often gets in the way of our otherwise simple actions. One of the things that we all have to learn in this world is to be humble. Not to be the kind of groveling humility uh, that no one likes, including ourselves, but a simple willingness to be corrected when we are wrong, a delight in seeing someone who knows more than we do, a willingness to listen as well as to speak, and an open-mindedness that makes it possible for us to receive ideas without subconscious objection from the beginning. Many people listen only sitting on the edges of their chairs waiting to interrupt the speaker. They know before he says anything that they know it better than he does. Emerson said there isn't a man in the world, no matter how foolish that he may be, who doesn't know more about something than I do. Therefore, it is best to listen. Most tense people are poor listeners. This is a very common experience. They are so desperately anxious to take over a situation to correct everyone else's mistakes, that they have no time to consider their own. This causes tension. This competition of peoples, or competitions of ideas, always 
will lead to uh, head-on collisions of some kind or will cause the person not to be properly appreciated for the real values that he does possess. Another type of problem that arises with this is the good old-fashioned inferiority complex. The person who believes that because he does not know everything, he does not know anything. This is, uh, again, a false attitude. Each person who has lived a reasonably constructive life can be interesting if they will permit themselves to be interesting. But to live in perpetual awe of some form of knowledge that we do not possess causes us to deprive others and ourselves of many areas of self-expression that are both interesting and delightful. On many occasions I have discussed interesting problems with persons whom you might not suspect would have interesting viewpoints, and some of them have had the most interesting that I have ever heard, because in his own way many a simple person is a kind of natural philosopher. A natural person who has learned something. And out of living, we all learn if we permit ourselves to. And it is interesting to share this learning rather than attempt to dominate it all the time. So we can say rather simply uh, that uh, tensions arise <clears throat> out of the inability to adjust easily to situations largely because of the psychic load we are carrying. There are people who are never happy anywhere unless they can get someone into a corner and unload. They've got to tell their troubles. They've got to find some way of increasing sympathy for themselves. Well, if the trouble is unique and unusual, it may be interesting once, and the individual may get the sympathy. But repeated indefinitely, it leads to boredom. Gradually, the listener subconsciously comes to the conclusion that the unhappy person is largely responsible for his own troubles. This ends what otherwise might prove to be a vital relationship. There is another kind of t problem with tension that we also have to think of, particularly in religion, where it shows up very frequently, and that is the chronic do-good. Now, a chronic do-good is a person who lives only for one purpose, and that's to help other people. And my experience has been that most of them are pretty helpless people themselves. The do-good is the individual who simply cannot relax away from the fact that every action, thought, and emotion that he has must in some way be a public benevolence. This is tiring in the extreme. It causes this person to complicate the lives of others all out of proportions to the facts, and it also causes the person a great deal of sorrow. There is nothing that can get us into an unhappy state quicker than taking over the management of other people's lives. We work so hard for them, we try so desperately, and they are not grateful. They are not only not grateful, but they are afraid to use the advice, because looking at the person who are, is giving it, they find that person in all the problems that they are trying to solve for someone else they discover that the person who is giving the advice is not a well-integrated person, that their advice is not important, and therefore probably could not practically be applied. The person who has this chronic impulse to help so seldom has the deep and abiding determination to qualify for the job. If you can get a person who is trained to help in the area of his own skill, a great deal can be accomplished. But a person who is not able in any particular area, has never disciplined or integrated his own thoughts and emotions, 
who suddenly decides to become a universal helpmate to something can and does cause a lot of trouble and ends in a great deal of misery because they can look back on life and say, well, all I ever did in my life was try to help people. It was enough. It was more than enough. <laughs> Very few survived it. <laughs> Yet the person can never get over the idea that he has been so good and so unappreciated. When we are not appreciated consistently over a period of time, it is well for us to examine our own merchandise and see whether it is worthy of appreciation. And it is also sometimes good to pause in our way or along the course of making life better for others and see what we've done with our own and also be very sure that we are not engaged in this rather dangerous enterprise simply because we cannot live with ourselves. When we begin to examine these things, sometimes we see why life has seemingly been rather cruel to us. It's the fact that we've never accepted life in a reasonable or proper way. But regardless of what the situation may become, if we have enough negative retention out of the past, we are going to live in a state of continuous psychic stress. We are going to live in a condition of personal tension. Personal, a personal tension is an irritation, a psycho-nervous situation. It simply means that we are not harmonious on the inside and that the stress in the psyche is expressing itself through stress in the personality. Tension is a dangerous thing and it is a very expensive thing. Nearly all decisions made under tension are poorer than they will be if they are made in a state of relaxation. Tension makes us impetuous. It forces us to final actions on situations in which there is no justification for finality. Tension causes us to meet things with brittleness, head-on collisions, where there is no requirement for such utter allegiances or rejections. Uh, tension also causes a general confusion in which it is difficult for us to determine the values of the various projects or situations that are offered. The nervous person, the excited person, the revengeful person, these are not in a good condition to make immediate decisions concerning their present way of life. I know one individual who took all the money they had out of the bank and invested it in a worthless stock simply because a close relative had asked them not to. They just had to prove they could do as they pleased. This was a phase of tension, a rebellion situation. It was poor thinking, it was extreme action. It was an evidence of a bad psychological situation within the person. When we want to do something merely because others do not want us to, or do not want to do something merely because they do want us to, our thinking is very crooked, and we are getting ready to have more troubles. And we will always find some excuse in the other person's conduct but we simply have not been able to master our own situation. So if we are a little uncertain about some of these things, let's watch our own daily conduct for a few days. Can we drive an automobile without accusing every other motorist on the road of being a bad driver? Are we courteous and thoughtful, or do we go on our own way and let other people come by the best they can? 
There is quite a group of psychological findings simply relating to the driving of cars today. The individual who must be first, the individual who insists on going out on the freeway at 15 miles an hour, the individual who becomes at any moment when emergency arises a self-appointed policeman. He is going to keep law and order if he has to wreck his car and kill everyone else. Then the person who doesn't care, to whom an automobile is a deadly weapon. The individual who frustrated and neurotic finds driving a powerful car the one opportunity that he has to feel his own self-confidence. These situations prove the kind of background the individual now adds to his body and other personality a new instrument, a new kind of body, a powerful mechanical device. And he proceeds to indoctrinate that with his neurosis just as he has already indoctrinated the natural body which he possesses. So we watch ourselves a little. Do we remember that an easy, reasonable way is the best? Are we in great haste all the time? This is a neurotic symptom in most cases. Because we really do not know what to do with those few minutes that we try so desperately to save, sometimes at the expense of our lives or the lives of others. Are our plans such that we do not need these last moment emergencies? Are we so chronically dilatory that we start everywhere too late to arrive properly? Study these points in ourselves. And if we find that there are bad habits that are endangering present decision, we may not be able to undo the past in all of its aspects, but we can certainly take hold of things now and with the maturity of our present understanding, slowly discipline ourselves into an orderly way of life, life under tension. Today we have this, probably more than ever before in history. World affairs, national affairs, personal affairs are all creating tension in the individual. One reason for tension, of course, is lack of adequate material for solution. When we are in a situation in which we do not know what to do, then tension becomes especially dangerous. We become desperate. Desperation is an extreme tension. And we thrash out in all directions, hoping that by accident or incident, we will have done something right, although we do not know why or how. That we should reach this period in our civilization and find average ordinary happenings, continual emergencies, speaks a great deal against the adequacy of our education, our philosophy, and our religion. It points out that the individual has neglected his own nature to a dangerous degree, that he is living entirely upon hope of circumstances, that he is hoping that some currents or tides in the ocean of life will drift him into a safe harbor. Such occurrences are comparatively rare. It is far easier, simpler, and quicker to steer the ship yourself. In reaching middle life or more, we find still that we cannot face ordinary circumstances. Then there is something that we have seriously neglected. And in this neglect, tension is no substitute for skill. It will reduce whatever degree of skill we may possess. We cannot fight it this way. The moment a situation that is unknown arises, it challenges knowing. It demands that in this area we must learn to know. This presents a nice problem. And I've experimented with it myself, and I know that other people have experimented with it. There are two kinds of knowledge. One is acquired and the other is innate. Acquired knowledge is a degree of skill in certain things. It is a formularized knowledge. 
innate or natural knowledge is common sense. And common sense, in most instances, is the true foundation of an exact form of knowledge. In other words, all so-called science or scientific technique that we possess today, all skillful and authentic forms of knowledge are built basically upon common sense. And in them, in most cases, the common sense still shows through very clearly. If, for instance, you have never built a house before, and you want to make a joint of a certain nature in two pieces of wood, you have two ways of finding out what to do. One is to get a manual and study it. And the other is to simply say to yourself, what is the reasonable way in which these two pieces of wood can be united to meet the need? And nine times out of ten, your solution will be the same one that is in the book. All you have to do is have common sense. A person with a simple, natural, direct common sense who is open to the functions of his own inner mental resources can do a fairly good job in many areas where he has no specialized training. Everyone knows this. If, however, his tra the training requires some particular skillfulness, he may be a little time attaining to the full measure of that skill, because the truly trained person may have to pass through an apprenticeship. The common sense man also has to pass through an apprenticeship. He may know exactly how to drive a nail, but it may take a little time before he can drive it as smoothly and expertly as a skilled carpenter. But if he is cautious, he can still not hit his own thumb from very early in the experiment. Thus, in nearly everything, there are common sense ways of doing things. And common sense is available to the person who relaxes and approaches his subject reasonably. Nothing destroys common sense, however, quicker than tension with a whole load of prejudice. The individual who says, I can never do it because I have never learned how, of course, ends the problem right then and there. He has locked himself against being able to do it. The person who goes headlong into the situation on opinion and attitude will also get into trouble. The individual who says, this is the way the hammer, the nail, and the wood must work because I am always right, will probably turn out a chair or two with the legs on the wrong end or something of that nature. But if he will be quiet and allow common sense to lead him, and be willing to make a reasonable number of early mistakes and learn from them. We can do many things that we never believed it would be possible for us to do. So common sense can come through and enable us to solve problems of families and friends, solve many situations, simply by remembering a few simple truths that have come down to us from our ancestors. Perhaps a few lines from one of the uh, scriptures. Some little basic thought governing proper attitude, and the big problem dissolves. If, however, we never take any time for this, if we feel that we must fight our way and die on the battlefield, we probably will die on the battlefield. And it is questionable whether we will have advanced any cause very much to compensate for our own death. We will be among those who have more or less died in vain. The uh, third problem that arises from this is the tension, once it has set itself in our own natures, depriving us of the intuitive over sensory function which is available to us. Tension locks us in the poorest level of our own judgment. 
It locks us in the weakest part of our own nature. Did you ever get very excited and very tense and try to tie a bow tie? The more nervous you are, the more trouble you have. You suddenly find that you're all thumbs instead of fingers. You know perfectly well how to tie that bow tie, but you have declared war on it. You are going to prove who is master. And of course, the bow tie always wins. Because it has one quality you have not got. It is relaxed. <laughs> it is fighting no one. It is simply a limp piece of something resembling a highly glorified shoelace. And against this, you can batter yourself to death. The more excited and angry you become, the poorer the job. And this is true of everything in life. So tension simply disables us. We are taught to believe that unless we're on our toes all the time, we're a failure from a business standpoint. But if we're on our toes all the time, the only thing we will get out of it ultimately is fallen arches. There is no use taking these extreme attitudes. Some of the busiest people in the world are those who sit down quietly. Because a great part of action originates in consideration, in thought, in organization, and planning. The person without these is bound to have a harder time making a living and building a life. He's a prime suspect for ulcers, and he is almost certain to punish his arterial system, his blood pressure, and ultimately his heart. So this that we have to try to avoid by being reasonable people. And this brings us to the third act of our little drama, and that is the problem of contention. The individual who is nervously upset, who is neurotic, who is unable to carry with dignity the load of the day, generally seek some form of release through irritation. The poorly adjusted person is temperamentally unpleasant. There's always something out of control. They may be moody, submerged people who just never say the right thing, or they may be extroverted, excitable people who always say the wrong thing. But they are not adjusted people. They not only have this tension within them, but they surround themselves with a reacting sphere of confusion. The individual always lives in the center of an area of influence. And according to his own nature, this area of influence takes on coloring and appearance. Where there is tension within the person, there is always contention around him. Something is not right. The person is unable to create in others a reasonable degree of happiness or security. They gradually impel other people to highly defensive positions. These other people lose more and more their ability to care for and understand this tense individual. So we have to always observe this problem of contention. I've noticed a great many times that people who have these edgy temperaments are frequently proud of them. They feel that they have a right to have a personal disposition, regardless of what it is, and that they have a perfect right to expect other people to get along with it. These very ones, however, cannot get along with anyone else themselves. So we live in a world that destroys the basic principles of Immanuel Kant's 
categorical imperative. <coughs> Kant took the attitude that how you can judge whether a thing is right or wrong is rather simple. If an attitude you hold or a policy you dominate or you are addicted to was to become universal and everybody had to live the same way and everyone had to do it exactly the way you advise, would you or anyone else like it? This is the problem. And Kant solved it rather simply. He said those principles are right which if universally applied are just to everyone. Now, the person who is irritable certainly would not want to live in a world composed entirely of irritable people. He feels, however, that he has a right to be himself. Psychology, to a certain degree, has abetted his attitude, because it has assured him that he is the way he is, either because of the delinquencies of his ancestors, or because he fell on his head in infancy. There was nothing he could do about it. This is all very foolish. There is something we can do about it any time we want to. So the person who takes the attitude that if you, you like me, you're going to have to like me as I am, is more or less telling everyone else that they don't need to like him. And that's the way it's going to end. Because no one appreciates a bad disposition. Sometimes we have to put up with it. But we escape as quickly as possible. We don't respect it. We don't admire it. And we don't tolerate it unless the situation makes it impossible for us to extricate ourselves. But no one is entitled to an individuality that hurts other people. Any such individuality must hurt the person who has it. And the selfishness involved in a bad disposition is always going to backfire. The time comes when it takes its toll and its penalty. There is the moment of decision, and the person with the bad disposition is not the one who is favored. It is therefore very important for us to realize that if we go around as little storm centers, little areas of conflict, we had better do something about it. I know people who, if they pass through a room, will leave five arguments behind them. Everyone was happy until they arrived. These people did not appear to say anything or do anything that would justify such a change. They just brought with them a sort of psychic itch, and everyone took it on. No one was quite as happy. No one felt quite as friendly as before this strange tempest burst upon them. And there are people who are injuring their lives, their futures, constantly by carrying around with them this atmosphere of contention, unpleasantness, utility, negation. Now, I don't know that it is necessary to advise the Dale, Dale Carnegie course for everyone who isn't getting along well socially. I do think, however, that when we look back over a period of years and find that certain patterns are consistent, that sim simply our personality is inadequate, that we should sit down and try to do something about it. Almost all of this negative, undesirable, unpleasant personality summarizes around a negative core. An unpleasant personality is probably not something that results directly from cultivation. It is something that's there if you do not cultivate anything. If you make no effort to do anything but react, and you accept all the happenings that occur to you without any thoughtfulness or without any discrimination, 
you will ultimately probably develop one of these negative patterns. There is, however, many, many a way in which you can do something about it. And also relieve yourself of the burden of living with yourself. Dynamic constructive interests are nature's way of solving these problems. Nature surrounds man with two kinds of inducements. One may be termed the inducement to survival, made possible through the various arts, trades, professions, and crafts. The individual is induced to be thrifty, uh, to be hard-working and patient, and to build for himself a measure of economic security. But nature has other inducements. Everything that nature packages, she packages beautifully. Nature is constantly offering us a whole cycle of psychological opportunities. And these are the ones that are most likely to be neglected. Nature gives us the tremendous dramatic of thoughtfulness. How to understand not only nature, but all the works of nature. Nature is forever spinning us riddles, hoping that we will find the answers. Nature is trying to stimulate us to be more observing and more reflective in our relations toward life. Thus, along with the opportunity to be rich and prosperous, comes the opportunity to be thoughtful and happy. Unless we take advantage of this psychological opportunity, the rest of our attainments get to be a burden upon the spirit. So man is surrounded with many opportunities to use his mind, those parts of his mind, which are not directly concerned with his economic survival. The individual may be shrewd in his business. He may be successful in his profession. He may be an authority in his line. And yet he may have a large part of his mental nature going to seed. He cannot take his business home with him and be happy with it. There are phases of his life which cannot be solved on a professional level. They have to be solved on the level of simple human understanding, pleasure, peace, contentment, affection, and regard. If these areas are totally neglected, the individual's personal life can go to pieces while his career is flourishing. But if his personal life goes to pieces to a certain degree, his career will follow. There are periods where apparently the successful outer life can dominate. But by degrees, the negative internal will corrupt the success. Thus, in our modern way of thinking today, we have not taken adequate advantage of the enriching and the perfecting and maturing of our abilities to enjoy, to appreciate, to understand, to share, and to give. We're amateurs on this level and professionals on business level. Not only are we amateurs, but we are rank amateurs. We are unable to function on these gentler levels and as a result have very little inner pleasure in life, little inner good. And we try to bribe ourselves on the assumption that if we cater enough to our appetites, we will please our soul. And this does not work. Just as a family that is not solid cannot be made more solid by merely spending money on it, so surely the individual who is bored with life cannot cure, cure this boredom by simply going out and buying something. There has to be this other level of enrichment. And this is the only true cure for this whole tension problem. If the person leaving his office and going home is going home to something interesting, dynamic, important, something which is giving satisfaction to the cultural phase of his own consciousness, the home will be better. 
if the various members of the family have some common grounds in art, music, or aesthetics, the family will be better integrated. If as we go through life we develop activities of value, so that no matter how monotonous a routine of work may be, we still have a tremendous dramatic color which we are adding to life, then we will not develop these subconscious pressures. They are the result of the neglect of the most valuable part of ourselves, the part that thinks and feels. Unless we educate this, culture it, and give it opportunity for successful expression, it is going to betray us in some moment uh, when we are in real emergency. Also, if our uh, activities do restrain us into narrower areas of social contact, interests and dramatic avocational patterns bring us into greater contact with other people on a level that is impersonal, on a level in which it is not nearly so likely that we will have conflict. We can admire achievements and hope that we also will achieve things that will be admirable. We can get away from this very small circle of locked living. And if we do not get away from it, it will crowd in upon us more and more until in the end it will take over our entire destiny. So we can only point out at this in this summary of the situation that starting with bad memories, memories of previous mistakes, moving these memories into present conditions to overshadow our present judgment, by this combination we endanger the present life of our consciousness. We endanger our ability to be happy now, binding our present life hopelessly to the misfortunes, misunderstandings, and misinterpretations of the past. If we continue, we will push this merely into the future, in which we will sit back and expect the worst because that is the way we have interpreted everything. Changing no part of ourselves, we have no reason to expect a better future. The only way we can escape from the past or even the limitations of the present is to escape into a well-planned future. A future in which we have learned to benefit from what we have done, have learned not to make the same mistake again, to enrich impoverished areas, and to simply regard negative attitudes as beneath the dignity of an intelligent person. If we have a few heart-to-heart -heart talks with ourselves and clearly face these problems, we can do just about everything that needs to be done. There is very little need to call in professional help unless the case is very far advanced. For most persons, it will take them no more energy to get out of their trouble than it took them to get into it. In fact, far less. The first problem is to recognize the need for change. And the second factor is to realize that it is nicer to be happy than miserable. And getting those two thoughts worked together will push us into a very much more adequate future. It has to be planned. It has to be adjusted to. It has to be accepted, a re-evaluation of ourselves, a natural, dignified, but humble viewing of our own natures, and a willingness uh, to want to recover. And when we think of it in terms of dollars and cents, it's good to recover. If we want to think of it in terms of the higher sense of man, it is still better to recover. For the person who improves his disposition, improves his entire life from that day on. He will become much more satisfied, happy, and adjusted. And we all need this, we all want it. But we all have to earn it by getting over the mistakes that we have remembered too long and too industriously. And getting our mind on the things that need doing.
and which we have carefully ignored down through the years. To change this polar relationship of ourselves to life, and life itself will, assume, will seem to change. Life does not change, really, but men change in their relationships to life, and through these changes they move from misfortune to fortune, from trouble to peace, and from pain uh, to security. These achievements are possible. They are being done every day. And every one of us can do them if we really want to. Time's up, time's up, time's up. Time's up. <laughs> now, we have an interesting subject for next Sunday that maybe folks don't know is as interesting as it really is. Where did you first learn about the three wise men? Nine people out of ten will say the Bible. But it isn't in there. Did you ever realize that? It only says in the Bible that some wise men from the East came. It doesn't say how many. It doesn't say where they came from. It doesn't say who they are or what they mean. And it certainly doesn't give their names or any details about them. Yet in the course of time, we have come to the present day when thousands and thousands of Christmas cards will represent these three delightful characters either riding their camels across the desert following the star or else kneeling around the manger in Bethlehem bringing their gifts. The wise men mentioned in the New Testament did bring gifts, but we do not know how many or where the story came from. And what is the relation between those wise men and the three jeweled bodies that are laid to rest in the great cathedral of Cologne. Who were they? What do we really know about them? Ah, a riddle. Please come next Sunday morning to hear all about it. <laughs> now, I'd like, now I'd like to also call to your attention that we have a coffee clatch today. Apparently everything is all right. I got back from San Francisco last night. It's raining, cold, and sleepy up there, but it's nice here. Also, I'd like to announce that Lecture 19 of our mimeograph lecture note, The Psychic Symbolism of Headaches, Insomnia, and the Upset Stomach, are available. that is available. Here is practically a money-saving device. So we hope you'll all take advantage of it. Also, the Christmas message booklet, which, you hope, which we hope you can use as gifts to friends, many have found it helpful. We have a number of, of older lectures, uh, no, lecture notes and so forth, on the table. Uh, we have one on rivers of faith, the evolution of the religious ideal and so on. And perhaps some of our friends would be interested in securing these as they do not occur very often. These older notes are getting to be pretty scarce. Also, if your name is not on our mailing list, we hope that you will uh, be kind enough to give us your name and address. This afternoon at the um, at 1.30 p.m. in the upstairs room uh, over the library, uh, the PRS Center study group will meet to discuss the talk of this morning. That's where you can really get down to all the facts. Uh, the uh, friends who have this regular study group invite anyone here who would like to to be with them as their guests this afternoon at 1.30 for the study group discussion. The library uh, will be open after the lecture this morning until 3 o'clock uh, to show some uh, rather interesting Japanese prints that have been on exhibition and uh, which we announced in the Japanese newspapers here, inviting the members of that colony also to view them. Uh, they will be on exhibition until December 18th, at which time the collection will be changed. Among the group uh, on exhibition is a set by Hiroshigi <coughs> on the Great Tokaido, or the road between Tokyo and Kyoto, the old King's Highway of Japan. This is a very interesting group, by the way, because these prints were made from drawings left by this great Japanese artist, and the drawings disappeared without the woodblocks ever having been cut. And they showed up many years later in Paris. 
the original drawings. They were later taken back to Japan and the cut, the blocks were cut. It's quite an interesting story and they are very beautiful prints. There is also a series of 33 uh, color wood blocks showing the life of Nichiren, the great Buddhist reformer. This series was prepared for the 650th anniversary of his passing. These are by modern artists, but they show the use of the woodblock print in religious design. And this is not as common as it is in other subjects. So we hope that you will be interested in them. Also, there are, will be, there will be a number of prints and uh, drawings and so forth that can be uh, purchased at inexpensive prices uh, if you wish, like to use them for Christmas gifts. Of course, the collection belonging to the library is not for sale. But we do have some uh, extra things which I have found here and there, which I thought might be of interesting, might be of interest to you. Uh, there is also a, a note that, uh, that this uh, project of the material that is offered for sale is a project of PRS Birthday Club, and the funds raised from the sale of these various items will go to the finishing of the furnishing of our auditorium, other projects, the enrichment of the library, and various things that need doing. So we hope that if you have the time, you will stop and visit a little bit with us this afternoon. And thank you very much.